The title today is Our Purpose in Life is to do the work that God has called us to do. One of the most powerful words that Jesus ever spoke just before he went to the cross. He said, it is finished. Okay? Now Jesus had been sent to the earth with a specific assignment and he fulfilled it completely. You glad for that? Yes. He paid the penalty for sin and death. He purchased redemption with his life. That's something. He finished his job on the earth. Then he handed the baton to us, if we put it that way. And Jesus gave us a command to the apostles before he ascended to heaven itself. And it outlines what Jesus expected the disciples to do when he had gone. Amen? Now, I'm just going to read you Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. And Jesus came, spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on the earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and I like the next one, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, this is called the Great Commission. And now it's up to us to continue the work of Jesus and the disciples. Okay? Now, in Acts 1 8, also a required part of the Great Commission, right? It says, But you will receive power. Now, that's the dunamis power, demonstrative power, when you have the Holy Spirit come on you. And you will then be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now the Great Commission is enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit that we are to be Jesus Christ's witnesses. We are to be fulfilling the Great Commission in our cities, Jerusalem, in our states, countries like Judea, Samaria, and anywhere else God sends us into the ends of the earth. Now, Jesus finished his part in God's plan, but most Christians don't even know what it is that God expects of them. And that's a little sad, isn't it? Well, 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, But we are to stand in Jesus' place as ambassadors of God, preaching, be reconciled to God. Did you know you were an ambassador? They're pretty important people in this world system. Well, imagine about God's system. We're all called to be ambassadors. Now, the great commission the disciples received was to take the gospel to all nations. Not just the Jews, or to those living in Judea, but to the entire world. Amen. So what exactly, then, is the gospel message? Well, it's the gospel of good news. It's a message revealing why God created mankind. Now, man's destiny, if he is willing to accept it, is to live forever and have a relationship with God as a member of his family and develop the same character that Jesus had. Now, with that in mind, let's look at the first words God ever spoke to the human race. It's recorded in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he them, God created he them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful. Be fruitful. God always wanted the human race to be fruitful. And he said, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Now, the first two words God spoke then to mankind was when he expressed his purpose for all of us. Be fruitful and multiply. And then he continued, and have dominion over every living thing. So God's very first 
orders to mankind were subdue and have dominion. Now likewise, as a born-again person, we're restored, we're a child of God, then we are to exercise that dominion over your world that you live in. That means every aspect of daily living, every circumstance in your life, should be in subjection to you, just as you are in subjection to God. But far too many believers are living in bondage to circumstances like poverty, oppression, and sickness. This should not be. Now Psalm 8 verse 4 to 6 says this, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Now the word translated angels there is actually the Hebrew word for Elohim, and it is one of the Old Testament names of God. Now the Amplified Version puts it this way, You have made him but a little lower than God, or heavenly beings, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. Now God meant for you to be in a position of authority. That's every one of us. A position in which all things are under your feet and you are in bondage to nothing. You are a child of the Most High God and this scripture tells us that he has crowned us with glory and honor. Not because of who you are, but because of whose you are. This is a big difference there, all right? Because of who you belong to. But not everyone is living that way, are they? All men and women, they have a free will. Men and women are free to choose, to obey, or to disobey. Now, those choices, while not the will of God, can do and affect all those around them. Now, people can choose to lie, to steal, to kill, and none of these things are what God wants. I'm sure you understand that now. Nevertheless, evil people exist. As a result, the people around them begin to suffer. All men and women have a sphere of influence that's impacted their free will. The events that take place in the world, in our lives, can be uh, divided into, let's say, two categories. Number one, those things that happen within our sphere of influence. Number two, those that happen outside of our sphere of influence. Now, our decisions affect our sphere of influence. And this is an important truth that we must all understand. Secondly, we live in a world that is still under the influence of the devil. Now, Paul declares him to be the God of this world. Now, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 tells us, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. And then in John 10, 10, it tells us, Jesus said that the devil comes to steal, kill, destroy. So John proclaimed that this entire world lies under the devil's influence. So 1 John 5 verse 19 tells us, We know that we're of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The kingdom of darkness is not God's will either, and yet it exists, doesn't it? Now Colossians 1.13 tells us, Those who receive his redemption by faith are translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of God. They are enabled to live by faith and walk in abundant life if they so choose. So thirdly, we understand that, remember the flood of Noah? The planet was shaken to its core then, as the depths of the water were broken up, the seas. Tremendous change took place and left the planet from that time on a little unstable and dramatically different from its original state. Now there are earthquakes, tornadoes, cyclones, droughts, floods, fires that bring death and destruction over the years to millions. Listen, God does not send them and he does not need them for his purposes. They bring death, destruction, not life and peace. Okay. Now these things will happen, but God is not involved in causing them. Suffering and death are not God's will. He has commissioned us to go into this world, preach the gospel of his love. 
It makes no sense for God to be killing the very people we are to reach. Now, within our sphere of influence, however, we do have authority and we can have dominion. We are responsible for renewing our minds. All right, Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. Okay? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. We have authority over sickness and disease. You personally have that authority. You don't have to put up with it. Start speaking to it. Bind it. Loosen it from you. We're endued with power from an eye. And we're commanded to heal the sick. Now, we can speak to the elements of nature as well and rebuke them as Jesus rebuked a storm. We can do the same thing. We have authority to pray that God will raise laborers to send into the harvest, to reach our loved ones with the word of God. We have the capacity to marry wisely, to raise our children in the admonition of the Lord. We've got biblical principles concerning how to handle our finances and how to release the power of giving and receiving into our lives. We've even been given authority over the enemy if he appears. James 4, 7 says, by the word of God, we can submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, he will flee. That's if you know the word of God. We can't determine what will come our way, but we can determine how we're going to react to it. We should never say that our failures are really just God dealing with us. Many people say things like that. That would be unfair to God. He's equipped us with his name. His spirit, his word, his armor, his covenant, all of his promises. The keys of the kingdom given to us, the, the authority to bind and loose. If we fail, it's not his fault. We choose whether we are prepared to take the steps to be fruitful spiritually in this life. Now Isaiah 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Did you hear that? It's your lack of biblical knowledge, the word of God, that destroys. So, does God control or allow bad things into our lives? The answer is no. God has equipped us to live victoriously in this life, no matter what may come our way, and things do come our way, don't they? He's not the author of tragedy and destruction. We are living in a fallen world. And it is our responsibility to determine our level of victory in this world. God's will is that we become doers of the word so that we can respond in faith when trials and temptations are coming our way. He wants to deliver us. He wants to prosper us, every one of you. But that deliverance and prosperity depends on us, not God. God will intervene in our lives only by the means of faith in him. Now Colossians 1.10 tells us, Walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. See, you've been pre-appointed to be conformed to the image of his son, Romans 8.29. God has called his people to represent him. All right, God has called his people to be joint heirs with his son, Jesus Christ. He has called his people to enjoy his goodness. Biblical faith requires more than just believing in the Bible. Biblical faith means responding to what God says in his word. And we're always seeing new revelations all our life that are very appropriate in certain systems and things attacking us. But respond with the word of God. That will give you the victory. Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew twenty-two fourteen. But few are chosen because they disqualify themselves. They are unfaithful. And they do not respond with faith. And that's the very important thing. You don't come to church just to be religious. You come to church to gain knowledge, to develop your faith. Amen? 
By faith, we live in response to what God has done and is going to do in the time we live. So we learn from the Bible all that it has given us that we might reign in life by one, Jesus Christ, Romans 5.17. But we will never enjoy all the privileges of that unless we act according to faith. That's according to what the Bible is saying. Now, Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1.10, Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fail. You can't fail if you have the word working in you, with the knowledge of it. Amen? So you say, well, what things, Steve? Now, these previous verses tell us what these things are. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, 2, yeah, says this. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need. Do you believe that? What for? It says for living a godly life. We've received all of this by coming to know him. And he has given us great and precious promises. Now in view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. So supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with patient endurance, and patient endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive, fruitful, and useful you will be in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul also said in Colossians 3, 12 to 14, as the elect of God, Holy, beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. But of all these things, put on love. Now Christians need to choose to put on the clothing of Christ. You're not putting on good in order to earn anything. You've already got it all. Okay? Now we saw at the beginning of Genesis that when God created man, he created him in his own image. Correct? Mankind was equipped then to accomplish God's purpose in creation. Man was created with God's identity, his image, endued with his authority, dominion, blessed with his ability, the blessings, and commissioned with his work. That's the purpose then, to subdue the earth and be fruitful and multiply. Now, Psalm 115, verse 16, also declares that God gave the earth to the children of men. His plan was for men to derive his life from God and to accomplish his purposes in harmony with God. Now, God told us to be fruitful, multiply, replenish, and subdue. When we preach the gospel, we're fruitful. But there are other ways the Lord expects us to be fruitful. God also expects us to be fruitful materially. Do you know what that means? It means that he expects you to be a person of substance. That means everything you touch should prosper. So you and I should be fruitful in our lives, our occupations, our givings, our business dealings, which requires wisdom. Now the talents and the gifts that God has given you are not just between you and him. The talents, gifts, and fruitfulness are to bless all those around you. Now you can see that clearly in the parable of the talents, if you've read them. When God gave out talents, he expected to get extra back, didn't he? That's the fruitfulness and multiplication. God wants you to increase your wisdom, which goes hand in hand with wealth. Solomon is a good example of that. He was the richest, the wisest man on earth in his day. And the Queen of Sheba, visiting at one stage, observed that. Even Solomon's slaves were happy. Second Chronicles 9, verse 1 to 4, and verse 7 says, Now when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, see, his fame was because of his great wisdom, as well as his great wealth now. So Solomon answered her all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for Solomon that he could not explain it to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, 
the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the services of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers and their apparel, and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. And she said this to Solomon, Happy are your men, happy are those your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Why wouldn't they be happy? Because of Solomon, their whole country was blessed beyond measure. He was blessed to be a blessing. Now 3 John 1, 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things, not some, all things, and be in health just as your soul prospers. God wants you to prosper, to be fruitful, spirit, soul, and body. But in order to be fruitful, your mind, which is part of your soul, needs to be healthy and fruitful, doesn't it? Do you ever feel a little overwhelmed by all the, all the things you have to do? Does it seem like there's not enough hours in the day to get everything done? Well, the majority of people find themselves constantly rushing from one thing to another. Have you noticed that? Their to-do list is virtually endless, and so is their frustration and anxiety. This was never God's intent for the life of a believer. His intent was and is for us to live free from stress, anxiety, worry, and frustration. The question is, how can we really live a life of peace when there's always so much to do? And there's always something to do, isn't there? Now God has revealed the answer in Proverbs 16 verse 9. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. We may plan the way we want to live, but only God makes us be able to live it. It's interesting. When we commit our activities and demands and responsibilities to the Lord, and our thoughts will be established. Now Proverbs 16 verse 3 instructs us, Commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. Now, if we take time to go over our to-do list, if you have one, with the Lord, he will establish our thoughts, show us things that are the most important, and the things that are important for us to pursue, and also the things that we should eliminate. Have you noticed there's some things in your life you need to eliminate? I don't mean your wife or husband. Okay. Now, we can make plans... But the Lord is the one we should continually depend upon to direct our steps. Colossians 3.15, the Amplified Translation. Let the peace, soul harmony, which comes from Christ, rule, act as an umpire continually in your heart, deciding and settling with finality all questions that do arise in your mind in that peaceful state to which as members of Christ, one body, you were called to live. And be thankful, appreciative, giving praise to God always. And that's in Colossians 3, verse 15, Amplified. Look, any time we make plans, we should check our heart. Okay? If we become sensitive to God's peace in our heart, it will let us know what is right and warn us of things that are not right. When we follow the peace within our heart, we will always have peace in what we do. And it makes sense when you think it that way. Now, Proverbs 19.21 tells us that there are many plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that will stand. At the end of the day, what is really important is not that you checked off everything on your list, but that you have fulfilled the will of God for that day. Amen? Now, we can have many plans, we can do many things, but fulfilling the will of God every day is what will stand. Now, the third thing God expects us to produce is moral fruitfulness. The story of Noah is supposed to create a sense of caution in our hearts. Now, in Matthew 24, 37 to 39, Jesus said, When the Son of Man returns... That's what we're waiting for, isn't it? Look what it says. It will be like as it was in Noah's day. 
Now that can't be a good day because nearly everybody perished except the eight. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets, parties, weddings, right up to the time that Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. That tells me the majority are not going to be ready. Are you going to be ready? Please, I pray you will be because it's eternity. Amen? The people of that day didn't concern themselves with living morally, ethically. And isn't that how it is today? Yeah, it's probably worse. Don't let the world weigh you down. Don't be drawn away from God into their lifestyles. Search your heart for anything that might have come between you and him. Even if it's a wrong attitude at times, ask him to put the spotlight on any area that needs to be changed within you. All right? Now, you may be surprised at what he shows you. God is a God of love, grace, mercy, isn't he? But when we break his moral laws, we suffer. But when we keep them, we have an inward peace and joy. Now, John assures us in 1 John chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him. When your heart is clear, you'll start to pray with more confidence. Spend some time with God, simply waiting and listening. Lord, is there anything you want to say to me or anything you want me to do? Hosea 6.3 says, Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and the former rain to the earth. These rains would cause the crops to ripen and bear fruit. The scripture is saying that when you seek the knowledge of God, it will cause your life to become abundantly fruitful. We all want that, don't we? It will cause your life to prosper. As a believer, you have the capacity to hear from God. Jesus said in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. They follow me. That's how Jesus operated on this earth. He listened for, he heard God's words, then in faith he spoke and he acted on those words. That's why Jesus always fulfilled, all right, and was fruitful. He only did what he saw his father do. He only said what he heard his father say. The hearing of the voice of God isn't always easy. With so many other voices in the world making all kinds of noises, you must purposely listen for his voice. Once you hear him, respond. Now, the more you practice this, the more you'll know when God is speaking to you. Now, many start the race, beginning is the easy part, but finishing is more difficult. A faithful person always has to draw from the word of God he has sown into his own heart. All right? He has developed a personal relationship with God and will continue whether, you know, anyone stands with him or not. Not everybody always agrees with you, do they? He knows that God will never leave or forsake him. Jesus saw all of his disciples forsake him, didn't he? Only John returned and stood by him at the cross. That's true, isn't it? Only John. The important thing is not who starts, but who finishes. We've got to finish the race. This is why many are at the starting lines, but only a few cross the line or finish at the line. And God is more interested in how you finish. Now my prayer for you, every one of you, is that God will accomplish what he wants to accomplish through you. Amen? And each and every one of our lives. When Jesus left this earth, he said, I have glorified you upon the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. That's John 17. Let's do the best and do the same. Amen? Amen. 
God wants you to do the best you can. Look, if there's ever a time, this is the time right now, that we should try to do more. Now, in your personal study time, allow a time through the week to really study. It's very important, the Word of God. Because as you do, and your intent is to please God, He will begin to show you things you've never seen. And that's that's His purpose. Why? Because when you know something that could bless somebody else, He will put somebody in your path. Plenty of people out there that don't know anything. Now, you can be religious, but religious is not the way. It's the way of the Word, you knowing God's Word, the Bible. That's important. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Amen? All right, praise God.